Hello everyone and welcome. We have an absolutely fantastic session coming right up. We've got Dr. Mitchell Goldman. He is a world expert. We are absolutely so fortunate to have him. He is a father figure of dermatology, a pioneer, and he even has his own Wikipedia site. He's written a number of books. He's going to be spend, spending half an hour with us on this pigmentation, and I highly recommend you buy his book. He has written a number of books, and we're ever so lucky to have him. Um, so I warmly welcome Professor Goldman. Well, thank you, Liz, and it's uh, great to be with you virtually. Of course, one day I'd love to be with you in person. So for those of you that want to see a really good Photoshop picture of me, this is it. Um, and as Liz said, I, I do like to write uh, books and stuff, and I do like to sort of develop different laser systems. It's interesting, after uh, Dr. Bitter's incredible lecture, I don't know if I should even talk anymore because it looks like the BBL Hero can do absolutely everything, but We'll sort of look at some other lasers uh, that could perhaps do uh, even better or at least as well as Dr. Bitter's uh, techniques. And then as Liz said, uh, I do like to write books and even though this book's an oldie but a goodie, it actually is still pretty up to date. Um, these are the companies that I basically do research for and for any other companies out there, if you want me to do research, I'll do research for you too. Uh, I am brought to this uh, meeting by SOLTA, and so this will be uh, mostly a SOLTA talk, but I'm going to try to talk about many different systems and not make it a just one system that can do everything in the entire world. So this is uh, one of my patients. So, you know, Patrick uh, shows a lot of things about how great he can make his patients or his face, and so this is one of my patients. So, Patrick, try to achieve that. But uh, in all seriousness, uh, we really can't do this, although we really want to. And what I'm going to talk about now is just the fractionated uh, non-ablative uh, lasers, fractionated picos. And then for skin tightening, I'm going to talk about uh, lasers, lasers, radio frequency, and full focus ultrasound. So I'm going to try to limit my discussion because there are so many incredible speakers that you have in, from Dr. Bitter to Dr. Tangetti and more, and of course, Dr. Ross, that I'm not gonna try to go over any of what they're saying. So some of this, of course, you all know, but this is basically the principle of non-ablative fractional photothermolysis. It's putting holes in the skin uh, and allowing the non-treated skin to actually cause healing. Um, and we're going to see there's a number of advantages of doing this type of a procedure. We'll first talk about the fractionated 1927 thulium laser. Uh, this basically is meant to disrupt the epidermis, and it's incredibly good for the treatment of melanin. And so dispigmentation is what we use it for. Um, and there's a few different lasers now with, that have this wavelength, and it also creates these little lesions in the skin, which allows for the uh, transepidermal um, penetration of a variety of skincare products, which makes this a little bit better than even something as great as the Hero. So when you look at the, uh, this uh, 1927 laser, and this is the clear and brilliant, which is the easiest and, and lightest of these treatments, you can see that in a fairly young patient, you can achieve pretty remarkable results uh, treating her dispigmentation. When you use the more aggressive 1927 called the Fraxel Dual, instead of three treatments, you can achieve something like this with just one treatment. And so you can achieve very nice results with, uh, can, in conditions like this lady has a combination of rosacea and melasma, which may be very difficult uh, to treat uh, with the present uh, day lasers. But one of the things I like the best is that you can actually increase penetration of skincare products. And those of you that know me know that I, I do like uh, to use skincare products, having founded Skin Medica and a number of other uh, skincare companies. And so Roy Geronimus's team did this study on basically skin grafts and showed 
that you could actually increase the penetration of uh, by 17 folds of topical antioxidants. And they use the SkinCeuticals uh, product uh, with the Clear and Brilliant versus just the skin uh, alone. And so when you're using different products, and here you have a patient that had five Clear and Brilliance, and we combine this with the Skin Medica TNS serum, you can see that you can achieve very nice results in her post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation from acne. Here's another patient with really uh, bad dispigmentation and melasma. And you can see here, we used a few different products. We used the Skin Medica Lytera, we used the SkinCeutical CNE Ferulic, and we used the 4% hydroquinone uh, pads. And so you could achieve very nice results uh, by using a combination of lasers and skincare products. And this is a, a patient, a younger patient, who again has some photo damage. And we used a product from ISDN called Melatonic, which is a really cool product for causing rejuvenation as well. So you can potentiate the action of a variety of different lasers uh, by using uh, skincare products. Now this is that Fraxel 1927, a little more aggressive than the Clear and Brilliant. And you can see that the results not only are immediate as we see in most of our studies, but they can last for long periods of time. And this is 12 months after a single treatment in a patient that has pretty significant melasma. This is a patient that actually was treated with a combination of lasers, including uh, the thulium and the intense pulse light and the pulse dye laser. And you could see that here, we used a fractionated picosecond laser. And this is a three-year follow-up on this very severe melasma. And this is going to take me into the next part of the lecture, which is everything doesn't have to be treated with a thulium laser. There are other lasers that you can use as well. So I'm very blessed in my office because I have a number of incredible associates um, who used to be my fellows. And these were Do uh, Dr. Wu and Jones, Bowen and Al Haddad. And we did a study because I always like comparing things to the fractionated 1064-532 Pico Way uh, with the fractionated Thulium uh, laser. And what we did is we basically randomized patients' faces and did one half on one, one half on the other, and we assessed our patients. And we found that, and you can see here, before and six months after a third treatment, really nice results, no topicals, just laser alone. And you really can't see much of a difference between the 1064-532 fractionated and the 1927 fractionated. And indeed, when we looked at all of our patients, we found that there was no real difference in elastosis or erythema or dyschromia or keratosis, all of which improved significantly. Um, there was no real difference in skin texture, which improved significantly with uh, both uh, laser treatments. And patient satisfaction measured by a global aesthetic improvement score or an investigator satisfaction score were also identical and much better. The only thing that was really different is that it turned out that the picosecond 1064-532 fractionated gave us less redness at days three and four, less swelling at day five, less crusting throughout the entire treatment period, and less peeling, also a little bit less itchy. But interestingly, even though the picosecond 1064-532 gave us a little bit better healing response, patients were satisfied equally with both of these uh, lasers. So basically, both um, the thulium fractionated laser as well as the pico wave fractionated laser could achieve equivalent photo rejuvenation, but we did find some less downtime with the pico wave. So another thing is to compare it with intense pulse light, because most of you know that I actually helped develop the intense pulse light. And interestingly, I taught Dr. Bitter how to do it. And now, of course, he's way better than me with intense pulse light. And so we actually did a comparison because my late partner, Dr. Fitzpatrick, who many of you know, 
who's one of the real fathers of lasers, loved to use a lot of lasers. And he would treat all of his patients with a combination of the 1927, a pulse dye laser, and a Q-switch Alexandrite. And I would treat this exact same kind of patient with just an intense pulse light. And so Doug Wu and Dan Friedman, when they were my fellows, decided, okay, we're gonna see exactly who does better. Does Goldman do better or Fitzpatrick? And what we found out is it's about the same. And so you can see that when you use this combination of three different lasers in the decolletage area um, or an intense pulse light, and just this was not the BBL Hero, this is the M22 Luminous Intense Pulse Light, you could achieve very similar results. The overall improvement was about exactly the same uh, between either using the three lasers or the intense pulse light. Patient perceived improvement was the same. The downtime was the same. Pain and discomfort was about the same. And overall satisfaction was about the same. So I sort of agree with Dr. Bitter. Intense pulse light probably is gonna give you a pretty good result, especially with patients that have erythema. So just like Patrick, although I'm not as handsome as him, I did this, this similar study on myself. Uh, I didn't use intense pulse light because I am concerned uh, that intense pulse light is gonna really be painful in hair bearing areas and give you like a moth eaten appearance of your hair. So I don't use intense pulse light on, on men, except men that wanna be feminized. And so here on my face, because I didn't want to be feminized, I did the thulium laser to one side and I used the speak away to the other side. And you can see healing response pretty much the same, results pretty much the same, um, and whether you're using the uh, Pico Wave 532-1064 or the 1927. So not as handsome as Dr. Bitter, but at least it worked on my face as well. So in conclusion, IPL is an excellent treatment for pigmentation and erythema. It is somewhat painful, at least in my uh, office. It does require multiple treatments. And I really don't think you should be using IPL in hair bearing areas of men, especially men that don't wanna look like not men. Um, but the 1927, as well as the picosecond, is also an excellent choice because you can use topical anesthesia, so it becomes practically painless. It doesn't work as well for the erythema, but the big improvement is you can use skin lightening agents and antioxidants, and they're gonna work even better than, than if you're just using the antioxidants and bleaching agents alone. So in my office, it's a toss up, but at least I like to use uh, 1927s or the fractionated Pico lasers. Okay, so let's now talk about skin tightening. For those of you that have read the New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of the uh, publications in the United States that's pretty popular, you may have seen this case report. This is a truck driver uh, from Massachusetts who basically came in and one side of his face had profound elastosis, the other side not. Now, of course, if this guy was in Australia, it would be on the other side because you guys, for some reason, drive on the wrong side of the road. So you can probably use a lance and, and kill someone when you're doing uh, jousting or something with them. But in America, we don't do jousting anymore. And so we drive on the right side of the road. So what is the best way to do skin tightening? Without a doubt, without any question, it's a facelift. So if we really wanna to get to the bottom line, the best way to tighten skin is cut it out and tighten it up. But people don't like to do facelifts all the time. It's really expensive, they don't like the scars. I see amazingly poor results, even from really good physicians here. And so we're always trying to do different energy-based technologies. The three technologies I'm gonna talk about today for skin tightening are focused ultrasound, radio frequency, and of course, lasers. So let's start with lasers. We all know that lasers can do a lot of really cool things. And when Fitzpatrick and I developed the UltraPulse CO2 laser, that was like an amazing uh, revolution because we could, we could tighten collagen, stimulate uh, fibroblasts, 
and resurface the skin all in one uh, type, all in one session. We know that collagen can contract at 65 degrees. Orthopedic surgeons use it for treating uh, tendons. ENT doctors use it for treating tympanic membranes. Uh, eye doctors use it for resurfacing the eye and, and causing the lens to contract. And we can use it on the skin as well. But the problem is that the collagen is only degraded and basically it requires the repair process to really get the skin tightening. And this was demonstrated almost 20 years ago where they basically showed us in electron microscopy what happens to the elastic fibers, at least in a rat skin. And you could see on the bottom uh, left-hand corner when you have UBV uh, light in, in the elastic fibers, they really curl up. But when you treat that same rat or his cousin with a laser, all of a sudden you get this decoiling of the elastic fibers. We know from other studies that you can increase your type 1 pro collagen and type 3 pro collagen. Um, and the results will actually, or the stimulation, last for about six months or more after CO2 laser. Uh, Voorhees has, in his group, has shown us that really you've got to destroy the fibroblast to get that healing response, that inflammation that can increase your MMP1s and 3s. And so the fractionated non-ablative lasers did, do not do this as much. And in our old UltraPulse CO2 patients, we can see that you can achieve these really nice results in one treatment that really lasts for long periods of time. It usually is five to 10 years before patients come back. Now, what makes every patient not get a CO2 laser resurfacing is the complication rate. And so, you know, there are things that can go wrong, ectropions, infection, um, hyperpigmentation, and scarring. And so we're always searching for easier ways. And so the fractionated uh, ultrasound is one of those easier ways. And what we can do is we can put little areas of destroyed fibroblasts uh, and collagen at various levels underneath the skin. And this is the Ulthera, um, and there's others out there as well that can really coagulate with a very good precision to the depth that you want. And Dr. Sabrina Fabi and I uh, did a study a long time ago uh, in 48 women um, showing that basically you could increase or improve their uh, skin laxity, but not that great, not like a facelift. You can get that 10, 20% improvement. Um, you get more improvement, especially in the upper face, especially around the eyes. But it's really, there's a lot of other things that take uh, effect here, which we're going to talk about in the next few minutes. So you have a patient like this, a heavy face, you know, a lot of fat, poor elasticity. You really don't get a home run out of this thing. This, this lady really does need a facelift. But you take a younger woman, um, you can see you can get incredible results in the upper face and, and the lower face as well. So you've got to pick and choose your patients very carefully to get really good results uh, when using any of these minimally invasive techniques. The problem is they are painful, and so some physicians don't uh, would, would snow their patients with narcotics, as done in this patient. And basically, when patients can't feel pain, they don't tell you about it, and they can get some ulcer, ulceration uh, with some scarring. So this brings us to the next technology, radio frequency. Um, Radio frequency is actually pretty good. It works like uh, uh, ultrasound by delivering heat irrespective of the skin color of the patient. It's going to warm the tissue just like ultrasound does. Um, and then there's different ways of doing it. You can do bipolar, which is very superficial. Monopolar is going to penetrate much more deeply as we're going to see in a minute. But it's very important that you really have to be in contact with the skin because if you get any arcing, you can get uh, skin damage as well. Well, this study was from Egypt. It was one of the thermage-like devices and they had really incredible uh, result in their patients. 
Um, I've not seen these results. Maybe it only occurs in Egypt, but, uh, but some people can get really good results with skin tightening with radio frequency. Uh, the thermage is my favorite uh, treatment to use. This is what I use, not on my face, because at 65, I'm still too young. But my wife's face, even though she's way younger than me, um, she always wants to look a little better. And this is the treatment that she likes to do. And I'm going to tell you why in a few minutes. So basically, it cools the skin. It delivers the heat under, under the skin, causing collagen contraction immediately, just like heating up the collagen to 65 degrees. But the key thing is actually stimulating the growth of new collagen, which can go on for three to six months. Uh, Vic Ross, who is, uh, was lecturing earlier, uh, lent us this slide. He uh, basically had a dead person's skin and he used the thermage on it, um, not that the dead person cared too much, and showed that you could get this heat going all the way down the fibrous septae. And this is probably a, one of the important reasons why this bulk radio frequency um, that can, is a monopolar can really deliver results in a much deeper manner than the other types of radio frequencies. So Thermage has been around for a really long time, 18 years. The original machine you could see there is, was really dinky in a little ways, and basically we were only using it for the eyes. That's where it worked the best. And the company kept making it better and better. Um, and now what I'm gonna talk to you about is their newest generation called the FLX. The reason this is an important slide is when your patients, as all of my patients, go on the internet and start looking up things like Thermage, they're gonna see re reports from the first generation machine, second generation. They're gonna have reports of med spas doing it with very poor techniques or, or doctors that really know what they're doing, um, doing it with better techniques. And so you've gotta tell your patients and teach them that the machines are, have gotten much better than what's on the internet, which lasts forever. And the technique is also very important. So what's different about the newest Thermage, the FLX? The treatments are actually pretty fast, and that's really good because the tips are bigger and they have an optimized energy delivery. So basically you can automatically calibrate uh, every single pulse, which results in a lot, of, a lot faster uh, treatment as well as increased patient uh, comfort, which occurs from both the cooling and the vibration. This is uh, what the optimized energy del delivery algorithm looks like. Essentially, it integrates the tuning pulses into each individual radio frequency energy pulse. So, you know, this is the physics behind it, but it actually really does work. Um, these are the different tips. I heard in Australia, y'all don't have the 16 centimeter trip yet, uh, tip yet. Hopefully you will. And that's something we'll use on the body. Um, the best is the one over the eye because you can really achieve almost blepharoplasty type results. And then we use the four centimeter trip, uh, tip uh, very frequently. Um, why does vibration work? Well, the SOLTA people actually did a study in 12 subjects of vibration versus no vibration. And it turns out there's way less, almost half the discomfort when you're vibrating. It's sort of doing like the gate theory, um, sort of uh, fooling the brain into knowing what is pain and what isn't pain. Now, these pictures are from the Solta Medical Center, showing obviously really good results in skin tightening in this fairly young patient. Again, uh, we did a study on the um, Thermod device. This one was about seven years ago, so before the FLX, uh, showing again, 80% of our patients did have a mild correction. Pain level with the older machine was about a six on a zero to 10 and patients did have skin texture improvement as well. Um, then we did another study with the FLX, and this was an, an interesting study because we compared it to the focused ultrasound. So we did focused ultrasound on one half of the face. We did uh, bulk radio frequency healing with Thermage on the other side of the face. And what did we see? About the exact same improvement when we looked at the eyelid, when we looked at cheekbone roundness, when we looked at the myolabial folds, and assessing overall improvement almost exactly the same 
focused ultrasound versus bulk radio frequency. The only thing different was pain. Even though it wasn't statistically significant, patients recorded uh, about a 30 to 40% decrease in pain with Thermage. That's why I use Thermage on my wife. Ulthera well, is really good, don't get me wrong, but a little more painful than Thermage. Um, this is our latest study that we used on the FLX. Um, basically, actually we're up to 40 patients now. Uh, this will be presented uh, virtually at the American Society for Dermatologic Surgery meeting, which is coming up uh, next month. I don't know if it's gonna get you know 2,000 people like you guys have, but probably a lot of people will uh, tune in. And what we found again is that we had a, a nice improvement with the FLX, uh, which actually got better as we would predict from three to six months. So before we ever tell patients that they'll need a second in, uh, treatment, it's really uh, important to wait about six months. Um, and some of my patients, we actually do do two treatments. Uh, people like my wife will do a treatment every year or two to stay as young as they possibly can so that they can look as great as they can either on a bicycle or off. And so this is one of our patients you can see. Of course, the photographs uh, never do anything justice, but nice lifting that you can see around the eyelid, the cheek, the mandibular angle. So it's a really good device. So in conclusion, I think that the monopolar radio frequency uh, really does work. It's not a home run. None of these treatments are home runs like a facelift, um, but it's just one treatment that you can do. And now what we use is we use nitrous oxide, commonly called laughing gas. I don't know in Australia what you guys call it, maybe koala gas or, or something, but um, it really does work well. And so we do do a little bit of Toradol, which is an anti-inflammatory, but nitrous oxide is the key, makes it very little uh, pain. These are some of the results from the Solta company. You can see fairly good results in both the eyelids, the upper face, the cheek, as well as the mandibular angle. You can achieve sometimes a home run in the neck area, especially on younger patients. This is from Carolyn Jacobs in Chicago. Uh, this is from Mary Lupo in New Orleans. Again, I think this is a home run for around the eyes. Uh, almost makes it so blepharoplasties are not as necessary. You can see here another home run around the eyes, really nice results. Um, and then again, from uh, the late Vic Narakar, really great guy showing uh, great results uh, as well. Now, this is taking us into sort of uncharted territory. These are some of the results from the Solta Aesthetic Center, uh, which you can get with the body tip. In, in reality, in our office at least, we'll do some other things. We'll use topical skin care. We'll also uh, sometimes use a very dilute mixture of uh, PLLMA, known as Sculptra, but we can achieve things like this because there's no way in the world you wanna do surgical body lifts on your patients. The scarring is just not acceptable. So the key question is who's the best candidate? Obviously, if patients don't need it, they're gonna get the best results. But in all seriousness, you wanna pick a patient that has a good you know, internal, uh, uh, met, in, internal environment. You wanna uh, uh, have people with mild to moderate skin laxity. You don't wanna have really fat people with a lot of weight to pull down. And you wanna have people with good skin quality. Now these days, of course, you would wanna go younger, but you know, some of our older patients are looking really good and they have really good skin quality as well. And then finally, lifestyle. You wanna pick patients that aren't dying. You wanna pick patients that aren't like drug abusers or smokers. People that are healthy probably are gonna do better. So in conclusion, this is sunrise and sunset in San Diego. Uh, these are my grandkids. And this is the real reason that we wanna do what we do. We wanna make people happy. We wanna uh, do nice things for people. And hopefully we'll get out of this silly COVID situation and we'll be a better place. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Thank Golf, you, Dr. and that was fantastic summary uh, on pigmentation and skin tightening. Uh, John's going to load up the slides, but while he does, we've got a couple of questions come in, and, and that's from some of your maintainers. His initials are G G, and he says, and I, "How come Mitch Goldman looks so young?" And we know who that comes from. And Mitch, you're muted there. So we can, <laughs> I'm going to send Mitch. Okay, Mitch, this is for you. Unmute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now you can there hear me. We okay. want the secret, Mitch. <laughs> okay, the secret is all about happiness. I have incredible grandkids. I have an incredible wife. I cycle all the time. And it's just being happy. Uh, I don't have the BBL hero, but I did do the little Pico Wave and Thulium. So, you know, I have a lot of sun damage. And even though I'm a year older than Patrick Bitter, you know, I, I still look okay. It's happiness. <laughs> yeah, very, very true. Very true. Um, we've got a few other questions coming through, and one in particular was about the settings that you used for the Pico Way and how you actually did that. And there was another part to that question as well is how do you, you know, just comparing it to the 1927 again? Yeah, um, well, to be very honest with you, Dr. Doug Wu in my office, he's the Pico Way genius. And what we do is we actually, if you can believe it, we use the fractionated Pico Way. So when you put it on there, you really can't change a lot of the parameters, but we do it as high as we can, but we don't want to have bleeding. Um, and it just, it works. So the, the real question is how many passes? Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it's almost like as many passes as you need. Almost like when Patrick was doing the BBL hero thing. Uh, I, I don't know the correct answer. There is an artistic component to everything that we do. And so you just need a good artist. You need, you need good paint, but you do need a good artist as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, another question has come through about the thermage. And do you see, they're talking about side effects to thermage, and do you see lipolysis? You know, that is a phenomenal question. And I have heard that with the older machines, there were some cases of, you know, uh, lipolysis or fat atrophy. Um, I've never seen it. Um, and I, again, I think it's about how you do it. So, you know, you don't want to snow your patients under general anesthesia so that they can't tell you when it's painful. Um, I, that's why I love nitrous oxide. You know, the patient's real happy and everything, but if it's really painful, they're still going to tell you, and that's when you back off. So you cannot do this on a fully sedated patient. Um, I think that's when you are at risk for getting fat atrophy. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about going to the tightening and comparing it, the CO2 with the thermage? Well, it is sort of night and day because the thermage is something you can do and then go out to dinner that evening. The CO2 laser, you know, only if it's like Halloween, um, and this year we may not have Halloween, but if you, if you are doing a Halloween, then you could do CO2 laser and go out that same e evening. But if not, you've got a week or two of downtime. Um, it's just that the reason I go to the CO2, if patients have horrible sun damage, a lot of fine lines and wrinkling um, and sagging skin, that's when I think, you know, CO2 is just the best way to go. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll go to the, you'll pick the thermage. Yep. Yep. 
We have one other question um, just before we flick over to John, and that was talking about um, topical drug delivery with these devices. Yeah, I just I think that that is something that we don't stress en enough. You know, we all like to use topicals and there's so many incredibly good topical products on the market now, whether it's deep pigmenting agents or antioxidants or growth factors. So commonly we'll use a product from Singapore called Calisum and it's an umbilical cord lining mesenchymal stem cell extract, but Skin, you know, Skin Medica has a similar kind of one as well. You know, there are other companies, but it's like take your best extracts that you have and we put them on immediately after. And as Roy Geronimus's group shows us, it really penetrates. And so it'll penetrate for a few days. Of course, it penetrates the most immediately. Also, the penetration of the antioxidants like the CE ferulic from skin SkinCeuticals causes an increased healing, decreased erythema. So that's why, even though, shit, I'm, I'm almost the inventor of the IPL, but I do like the fractionated lasers because they do allow for the increased penetration of the products. And can I just ask a question stemming from that? Although it's really good to enhance the delivery, is there anything that you wouldn't put on the skin after a treatment with concerns regarding its penetration or toxicities? Yeah, uh, acids. <laughs> like I, I would be very leery of putting on trichloroacetic acid or phenolic acid or something like that, you know, because it is going to penetrate a heck of a lot more. But I think growth factors and antioxidants. I think those kind of things are really good to put on after treatment. Okay, no, thank you. So we'll go to a few um, cases. So here I'm relying on Mitchell to um, upload some slides hopefully there for us. Um, and we've got a, got a few cases and as you said, Australia is very much like um, California and, and where you where you work in the world that you know our patients are very very sun damaged but not, and often there'll be a mixture of things there and as you said I, I like the, the topic of your talk and that it sounded like it will cover everything the pigment and the skin tightening all in one and I know there's often the need to, to mix and choose but I thought we'd get your feedback on your favorite approaches to a few common problems we see. Um, so the, the colletage I suppose here it's an area really high impact, especially for girls, but also increasingly for guys. Um, but it's also an area where you can run into trouble if you're too aggressive and, and with toxicities and, and demarcation, etc. So I thought we have three cases where you have, you know, similar but overlapping problems and I'll ask your favourite approach and any cautions and concerns. So, so this lady, her main concern is the dyschromia. She's relatively young, um, doesn't have too much erythema. So what would be your favorite treatment is a patient with a mixture well, of pigmented lesions. Yeah, well, thank you, John, for this because it, there's a few different things I want to talk about. The first is obviously she's had a lot of pre skin cancers, and some GP has been treating her with liquid nitrogen and causing this hypopigmentation everywhere. Um, I don't use liquid nitrogen. Unlike Dr. Bitter, I really am a fan of aminoluvonic acid, of PDT. And so PDT is what I would definitely use in this patient with an intense pulse light um, treatment. And I actually use red and blue light or shoot, shoot, you could put them out in the sun and tell them to walk around um, and that'll activate it as well, probably just as, just as well. So, but the, the real question is, can you also use a fractionated? And you saw that in the study that we did with Dr. Fitzpatrick versus me, yes, you could use the thulium, you could use Q-switch alexandrite, especially for the um, area that's really pigmented on that uh, lower right, mid right hand side. Um, but you got to get rid of those actinic keratoses. And then lastly, for the sort of, uh, you know, the, the loose skin, this is where I love to use a very dilute Sculptra. I'll use a Sculptra diluted to 18 cc's and I'll inject it in and it works incredibly well to help to tighten the skin. Um, there are some doctors that will use Thermage or the uh, focused ultrasound 
um, to try to lift it. But if a woman has a breast that's more than an A or a B cup, there's no way you're going to lift uh, the skin. So for a patient like this, photodynamic therapy would be well, um, probably uh, some sculpture as well. And just one question with that, would you ever add a gentle CO2 before your PDT on, on this patient as well? You know, John, that's a great question. In the olden days, yes, Fitz and I would do CO2 all the time, but the problem with CO2 laser on this is you have you increase your risk of infection like a hundredfold. Think of a burn victim. Burn victims, the, the more problems they get into is directly proportional to the surface area being treated. The face has a really good vasculature, and so I've almost never had an infection with CO2 laser on the face. The chest, it's got to be in the 10-15%. So I personally do not use CO2 uh, or erbium lasers for the chest any longer. I'm just too old to, to take that risk. Uh, that, that's always good advice. So going on to the next chest where, again, okay, this lady's got a bit of trouble with pigment, a similar age, but she's also got you know quite bad rosacea on her face and redness is one of her concerns. So how would you approach this lady? Yeah, well, you know, Fitz would use the pulse dye laser and the thulium, and I would use the IPL. And maybe if, if Patrick lends me his hero, I'd use the hero on this because I think this is more of an IPL kind of patient. And if you're using the VBM, uh, V-beam and the um, 1927, do you do it on the same day or are you separating that out? Yeah, um, we actually, or Fitzpatrick, we would use them all on the same day. So essentially we would first do the thulium laser, uh, the fractal dual on the entire chest, then we would use the uh, Q-switch alexandrite to the individual pigmented lesions, and then we would use the pulse dye laser to the any of uh, telangiectasia or the erythematous lesions. So you could do that, or you could just use an IPL. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I think you've largely covered this in the last one there, but I suppose in this last patient where laxity is their, their biggest concern. Um, again, yeah. she's a nice slim lady, similar age as the other ones, but again, very different sort of skin troubles. Any other tips that you might do on this lady? I, it's like, again, I get her to not see a general practitioner, not use liquid nitrogen. You know, she needs to see an aesthetic physician. Um, sculpture, I think, would be really good because you can see her ribs are protruding in there. She needs some thickness to her skin. She needs some good topical skin care as well. This is someone I probably would use a thulium on uh, because I'd want to use the, the Fraxel and then also have a, some topical skin care. I, would, I, I think she would do really well with the calcium, that umbilical cord lining mesenchymal stem cell serum. You know, you, you, she needs thicker skin. <laughs> And I suppose if we got the answer for that, we'd be doing very well. Um, then on the next um, one there, so I'm just waiting for the slide to change. Okay, here we are. So I suppose this was covered before, and you were sort of implying in your talk that the non-ablative ones really don't have that same collagen sort of tightening or collagen repair stimulating. Do you think mentioned today are better than, than this combination we heard from um, Victor Ross earlier? I, I, you know, I really like Dr. Ross. He's right down the block from me. I see all of his patients. Um, it's like, I just don't like non-ablative fractionated. Even though I helped develop the resurfix for Luminous, it's like, uh, it just doesn't do it like I think we need to do. She, they, you need a little bit more. We, we covered that there before with a chest a bit more caution with a, a CO2 laser. We've got a Liz question, John, actually, while you um, flick up the next slide. Uh, uh, back to the uh, photodynamic therapy, we've got a question about the CO2. So I presume this is on the face, not, not on the body, but 
Um, for PDT, would you pre-treat with CO2 laser to enhance the penetration? Oh, that's, Liz, that's a great question. And the answer is absolutely. Um, here I'll use, I'll use a fractionated, almost like what Dr. Hedgestall uh, from, I think it's Copenhagen uh, or somewhere in the Scandinavian countries. She's taught us so much about the ALA penetrating down the fractionated CO2 or erbium. Um, what I usually do is, again, I'll put on a topical anesthetic, and then I'll usually use maybe 20 millijoules with a 5% uh, density over the individual areas that, uh, like the actinic uh, keratoses, then I'll do the, the uh, apply the ALA and then uh, do the treatment after, after waiting the appropriate amount of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think, as you said, our patients like yours, we need to not only make them look younger and better, I think that that dysplastic disease is always a priority for us as well. Yeah. So, so the next question, and you, you sort of touched on it there, but I think, as you said, especially with sort of skin tightening, you're at risk of having a patient with unrealistic expectations or being unsatisfied later. So I was just wondering, not only the advice, patient selection, but you know, what sort of imaging or what other precautions would you do for us when treating these patients? Uh, unrealistic expectation crosses the Pacific Ocean and every other area. It, it's so difficult because, you know, people look at the internet, they see these incredible before and after pictures. You know, they're paying a lot of money and they think they're going to get a perfect job. And so I always try to downplay everything. You know, Vic Ross hates the, the phrase, you know, under promise and over deliver. But that's my favorite phrase uh, because I tell all of my patients they're going to need multiple treatments. They're never going to look 18 again. If their husband is cheating on them, this is not going to make the husband not cheat on them. And so, you know, we have to play the psychiatrist as well uh, so often. But I really like the phrase uh, under promise and over deliver. Okay. And. Oh, actually, we're, there should be one more slide I'll add in that um, I apologise there, there, Liz, that they must have used an old slide set there. But I suppose we had a picture of a, a lady with sort of quite bad um, melasma that had sort of rebounded after stopping a topical treatment um, and your advice for sort of... In a dull time. I tell you, melasma, as we all know, is the single most difficult skin disease that I treat. Uh, you have to eat, use everything. Now that one patient that I showed you, uh, who we used every laser in the entire world, what ended up working with her was the uh, PicoSure. Um, but it required multiple treatments. It required topical uh, therapy. So you have to basically pull out all the stops. And then something that I actually first saw in Australia was HelioCare, was that, um, uh, Brazilian fern plant, uh, I, I forget how you pronounce it, podoxifilin or whatever, uh, polylip, whatever it's pronounced. But you have to use even orals to try to decrease the free radical uh, formation in the skin. But I use everything I can. And now the transemic acid is now my new favorite. And, you know, yes, I'm using it orally and we are developing uh, stronger topicals. SkinCeuticals probably has the best topical transemic acid now in their skin uh, brightening collector. Uh, but um, there are better ones that are going to be coming out. But, it, you know, there's no nothing wrong with giving your patients 200 milligrams of the transemic acid a, a day. So. The short answer is you've got to do everything in the kitchen sink in order to really uh, get home runs with melasma. Yeah. Okay. So and do you stop those topicals? Well, I mean, what's your protocol for stopping topicals before your procedures? You know, I don't. Um, and and the, the other, the more important question is when do you restart them? Yeah. And we all know that the more aggressive or ablative procedure you do, it does take the skin 28 days to sort of reform the tone of filaments and everything. And But I try to start the topicals really quickly. Um, and of course, uh, minimize not only sun exposure, but, you know, fluorescent light exposure too. 
um, because you, you actually will activate melanocytes even with, with room lighting. So, you know, melasma is, is so complex. It's going to take someone way smarter than me to figure it out. And uh, sorry, and that, uh, another sort of challenging problem is the patient where you're worried PIH is going to be an issue. Um, you know, what would be your go to treatment in these sort of patients where you want to minimize that risk? And any you know pre and post treatment precautions, and as you said, mentioning with the skin still healing, what topicals would would you avoid immediately afterwards? Yeah, well, the first thing is you know when we were doing the ultra pulse CO2 laser, you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, everyone felt that you had to pre treat your patients with um, hydroquinones and melanocyte sort of suppression therapy, and then it turned out. Nah, that didn't make any difference whatsoever. Um, and so the real question is, when do you then restart the treatments? And the, and it's really, you have to look at the, at the phrase post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. You can't cause inflammation. It's all about minimizing inflammation. So that's why when I do laser resurfacing, my patients are on super potent topical steroids um, immediately after because I want to stop the inflammation as much as I can. And actually, when I, I'm using the thulium laser, my patients will put on their topical uh, care and topical corticosteroids um, because I want to, again, decrease the inflammation. I think that's the most important uh, way to decrease that rebound effect that sometimes can occur. Mm. Okay. And is that the end of our cases we've prepared? So you said probably some more well, questions or other ones there? Yeah, there are. So uh, we've got uh, about six minutes left or so. And this Dr. GG keeps sending in a few of these questions. <laughs> Uh, well, I know who that is. Yeah, I know. No, these, these Melbourne doctors, I tell you. <laughs> so one uh, that he's just said, which got approved, by the way, um, do you think skincare companies should sell their products with home rollers? Oh, shoot. Okay, so 20 years ago, you know, this crazy South African plastic surgeon invented the home rollers. And he showed pictures of himself in the shower, bloody doing home rollers to his face. It's like, you know, anything is, is possible in any country. But I have seen recently patients that come in with pinpoint depressions on their skin that now I have to do ablative resurfacing because the home rollers actually in patients, especially patients with thick skin that's glabrous, can produce literally like incredibly, not large pores, but depressions. And so, uh, no, I don't think something like that should be approved uh, for people to do, but then you can have crazy people sticking themselves with pins and stuff. Mm. So I don't know, especially if, if some movie star does it and puts it on the internet, everyone's going to be doing it. So what are we going to do? No, that's right. Well, I, maybe Dr. GG wants some. <laughs> um, there is another, there's, there's a couple of questions just about going back to the thulium, the 1927, um, comparing it to the clear and brilliant and your thoughts of that. Yeah, the, the clear and brilliant is, I think, something that's practically idiot proof. It's, yep. it's something where if someone doesn't want downtime, if they don't mind coming back three to four times, that's a clear and brilliant. It's a no brainer. It's gonna increase your penetration of your products. It's a beautiful machine. It doesn't hurt at all. Um, so that's where I use it. If someone says, look, I only want one treatment and I want it the most aggressive that you can do, then I go to the Fraxel Duel. But the clear and brilliant, I think, is your perfect uh, laser to use on especially the younger patient and the patient that's working and cannot take time off. Uh, yeah. That's that's the laser I go for. Right. And how does it compare if you do the 1927, say, on a um, less passes, say half the passes? 
you know, I, I don't know the right answer to that, but I, I think you get less of a result, but yeah. I, I don't know the right answer. Yeah. Um, let's have a look through some of these. Um, oh, there's some of the questions have been on your aftercare with the 1927. So what anything not to do in particular was what people were asking. Yeah, I, I think the key thing is you don't want to like go surfing that same day or you know go out in the beach or be eaten by a white shark or something but you know it's just common sense you know you want to protect your skin from the sun you yeah. want to use uh, topical antioxidants you want to use topical growth factors um, and that's what I tell my patients to do yeah and anything um, I mean how long do you advise them not to say go out in the sun or protect themselves and do you advise them not to do any heavy exercise and things like that you know no uh, i don't care about exercise they can exercise as much as they want it's all like a common sense if they get their heart rate really high then they're going to flush maybe a little bit more but i think exercising is really good about going in the sun you know if they want to come back and see me every few months go out in the sun yes. if they want to conserve their money you know be smart about it and and don't go out in the sun or use sun protection you know it's common sense kind of stuff yeah yeah exactly yeah. um and that and i i think as you said you've done a really good talk there but another one i was going to just check with your pain relief i think that's important you were saying you really rely now on nitrous and maybe just a bit of an anti-inflammatory or, or even I think you call it acid aminophen. You're keen to avoid the, the stronger analgesics that might cover up pain. Dude, I, I really, John, I think it's so important because patients need to tell you because if you knock a patient out with many of our plastic surgeons do, that's when you're going to get ulcers and that's when you're going to get fat atrophy. I don't know, in Australia, do you all have nitrous oxide? Mm. We have it in our clinic and have found it yeah, invaluable from just it, treating walks and oh, kids to everything. It's, it's the best. And if you have a patient that's driving you crazy, just suck on some nitrous oxide and then it, it doesn't matter anymore. So I think nitrous oxide is the best. I almost want to put it through the air system. <laughs> I have to get rid of my HEPA system then I think that'll remove all the goodness. <laughs> uh, very true. And so, I think they're saying we just get cut off very soon. So it's, yeah, well, um, I think we're gonna, about to get cut off. So maybe we should just wrap it up because it's been a fantastic session. It's just so great to see how your mind works and to get this sort of invaluable um, information, knowledge, education from you, um, Professor Goldman. And we thank you for staying up sort of late on a Saturday night. It's what, 6.30 there now? It's, <laughs> you're no, it's seven, get up seven early. o'clock. My, my wife's calling me for dinner. So I got to go get some dinner now. Oh, but right. John and Liz, thank you very much. And Dr. Goodman, thank you for inviting me. He's the GG. <laughs> We weren't going to say that. <laughs> and, and one question, what sort of wine are you having? Is it from California or Australia at the moment or from? Uh, uh, no, you know colleagues? what? Greg turned me on to some really nice Shiraz. So, uh, but unfortunately, uh, this is actually, actually a Chateau Neuf de Pop uh, because the Tour de France is going on right now. And this is from the base of Mont Ventoux that they're going to be hitting in a few days. Perfect. Well, enjoy. Thank you.